Welcome to the Teachers on Fire podcast, where I profile agents of growth and transformation in education today. Each guest shares their highs, their lows, their passions, their goals, and the resources that are shaping their thinking and inspiring their practice. For show notes and links from each episode, visit TeachersOnFire.net. You can also follow the show at TeachersOnFire on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Let's meet today's guest. Well, Teachers on Fire, today's show will be a little different because this is episode 100. I'm so proud, pleased, and thankful to reach this milestone, and I certainly couldn't have done it without 99 awesome guests and the incredible fans and supporters of the show. One of those guests was Brian Carpenter, and that's at Brian Carr on Twitter. Brian appeared at episode 33 of the podcast back in July of 2018, and he has been a committed listener ever since. Brian has shared his learning from the show on Twitter. He's retweeted my content many times, encouraged my work, and has even, get this, hosted me and my boys at his home for breakfast. And unfortunately, mom was at work that day, but that was amazing. So when Brian asked for the opportunity to flip the mic in episode 100 and take over the interview chair, I could think of no one better suited for the job. Brian, I want to start by saying I appreciate you. Thanks for taking over the hosting responsibilities today and take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank you for coming on your own show today and answering all the questions that you've asked (laughs) your guests, which are a little bit challenging sometimes. Uh, So are you ready to talk education? Yes, I am ready to talk education. I'm feeling on fire, especially on fire today. I'll share more about that later, but let's go. All righty. So at the outset, why don't you tell us about where your current context is, where you're teaching, and what you're doing right now in education? So I teach in a city called Surrey, which is outside the big city of Vancouver. And Surrey is a city I made fun of for many years until I finally moved here myself. So be careful about what you make fun of. But I'm at a beautiful school called Pacific Academy. I'm in an eighth grade classroom context, along with three other eighth grade classes. And I teach most of the subjects with a few exceptions. And interestingly enough, that wasn't really what I signed up to do. When I came to the school, I thought I would be specializing and turned out that was not the case. But I enjoy what I teach. And I especially like teaching a couple of electives, entrepreneurship and media arts. And so altogether, it's a great package, great team, great community. And I'm just really thankful to be here. Well, that's great. Yeah. Pacific Academy is a strong school out here in the lower mainland. And uh, I've got another friend that works there as well. Okay. So it's story time. This is where you get to talk about yourself a bit. And I was really impressed when I first started listening to your podcast about how you ask this question and how meaningful this question is to every guest. And we get to hear a bit about their story. So please share with us a low moment or an experience of adversity that you faced in your teaching or education career and describe how you overcame it. Well, Brian, I've gained so much from hearing the stories of all of my guests and they've touched me in some deep ways sometimes. And, you know, I'm not sure I'll be able to offer the same insight at the end of my story, but I will take you to a low moment. And that is back in 2012. And actually, most of my story really relates to the personal side of things. And without developing the full details, I will just say that I was struggling in a marriage at the time. I was actually separated. I was living in a kind of a rough area of Vancouver, And so with all of the emotions that accompany a difficult separation and eventual divorce, it turned out that my the house I was living in actually burned down. And I got a text message from my landlord while I was in the classroom saying, come home quick, the house is on fire. And so I came home and this was in December in Vancouver. And so the days are short on the daylight and of course, a lot of rain. And I had to go through that experience of being homeless in already difficult emotional circumstances. And so I I did take one personal day off to sort of take care of moving and finding a new place and finding my feet again and not making sure that I wasn't homeless and I wasn't living in a hotel. So that's a whole other story. But I I guess the point is that I really experienced what it is to 
deal with intense emotional turmoil in my own personal life, but still have to present in front of our students. And, you know, we hear so much about the importance of being authentic in front of our students. And I do think that is the case. I, I, I'm a believer in that. But it's also the case that sometimes as educators, we are dealing with things that we just can't share with our students. I wasn't about to turn my classroom into a therapy session, and I just don't think professionally that is the right way to go. So I think I shared kind of the basics and maybe a few details and made light of the fact that my house caught on fire. But the reality is to go through that is is actually traumatic. And it was a tough experience. But on the bright side, I was surrounded by some really supportive colleagues, a few people in particular who really came alongside me in physical ways, you know, with a hug here and there and with words of encouragement, with practical help when I needed it. And I was able to get through that experience and get to some much brighter days. And thankfully, I'm, I'm in a much better place in my life today. But that was a good taste of the reality that sometimes, man, I mean, you know, as a teacher, you're up there at the front of your room and you can't share all of the turmoil, all of the trauma, all of the pain, but you still have to sort of put on that face and be that person, be that smile, be that source of warmth and love for your students. So it's not always easy, but the way I made it through was with the support of some amazing colleagues. Well, that's, uh, that's a challenging story to hear and uh, some trauma at that time that you had to face. And wow, you took only one day off. You probably thought about, you know, house on fire. And then that turned into maybe teachers. <laughs> yeah. you, you can you can tell us about that a bit later. So thanks, Tim, for sharing that uh, personal story with us. We hear others' personal stories all the time. And it's just, it is inspiring to go, oh man, I'm not alone in the stuff that I'm dealing with, you know, and how we have to present and be be professional with our students. Okay. As you look across your PLN and your own practice, what is setting you on fire about education today? Why don't you share with us? There are so many different things right now, Brian, that are setting me on fire, but I want to talk about the joy, sharing the joy and the exciting potential of content creation with students. I mean, I would say over the last two years, and we'll, we'll get to this more in, in more detail, I think, but over the last two years, that has completely ignited my imagination. And I think it comes out in what you see me doing on the podcast and on the Teachers on Fire magazine and, and in other places. So I am convinced that there is so much amazing potential. There's so much joy. There's so much power in communicating and in creating content. And I'm talking here about writing. I'm talking about audio. I'm talking about video and other means of content creation. So if I can just convince my students, my learners of the power and the possibilities, then I've done my job. And so that's part of what I'm trying to do in the classroom. Last year, I did a little bit of podcasting with students, and I'm excited to do more of it. I'm all about helping students form positive digital footprints. You know, we spent the last 20 years, or definitely the first decade, let's say, of the internet. And we thought it was our job as educators to really shield our learners from the internet, right? Keep them as anonymous as possible and hide them away behind pseudonyms and fake names and and find all these ways. And, and to some extent, I get it. I mean, that kind of makes sense. But there is a reality that we're all Googleable more and more so, I would say, every year. And as young people, as students, they have to decide how they want to be known online, in the, in the online world. And so I'm all about helping them to build positive identities that represent the values that they are all about, their passions, their purpose, their mission in life. And so when they get a hold of content creation, when they understand the potential that you know, when people Google their name, it's not just some random Instagram account and weird photos from whatever, but it's actually something much more valuable and impactful that comes up in those Google results. Well, now we're talking. Now we're talking about real contribution to the world in authentic ways. And so that really excites me. You know, John Spencer in his book, Launch and the Launch Cycle that he co-wrote with AJ Giuliani talks about bringing project-based learning to that critical place of launch. And by that, they mean sharing out with the world. And so again, I know we deal with all kinds of privacy issues and, and ethics when we get into this territory, depending on the ages of our students. But I think that's so essential. That's so important. And that's what pumps me up right now. Well, that's exciting. Uh, sounds like digital citizenship, but without you saying those words. It's about 
having students be present digitally and to have a positive self-image out there. Another word for digital footprints is uh, digital tattoos, because once you get those ugly things on yourself, they don't come off, right? So maybe the good things are footprints and the, the bad things are tattoos, or maybe we can, you know, make some nice colorful tattoos and put them on ourselves, right? So. That's right. We've all heard of Simon Sinek's books called Start With Why. And a recent guest of the podcast, Justin Belt, who has a podcast of his own called The Why Cast, talks to his guests about their why and how their why affects their every day. Tim, what's your why? And a little more pointed, why did you begin at Teachers on Fire more than a year and a half ago? Is your why for continuing the podcast now the same as it was when you began back then? Yeah, great question. So I'll start with the history or the origin story first. I began Teachers on Fire after listening to podcasts for more than a decade. I just slowly came to love the medium more and more. And I was doing more and more commuting as well. And so I had more time by myself in the car and I was listening to more podcast content. I started listening to financial podcasts. I listened to someone named Dave Ramsey for a long time. And then I listened to a lot of sports podcasts through a network called Sportsnet. And then I got into others. Over time, I eventually got into entrepreneurship and business podcasts. And you might think that's not a natural fit with teaching, but I really liked the message of what I was just talking about, which is content creation. And it was exciting to hear about how other people are using the internet to share their message and to actually impact other people's lives. And through different podcasters and people like John Lee Dumas and Chris Ducker and Gary V and others, I started to really get the power and the potential that I just talked about. And so I particularly liked an entrepreneurship podcast called Entrepreneurs on Fire with John Lee Dumas. And at the time he was publishing every day. Now he only publishes a couple times a week, but I still love what he does and appreciate and and respect his brand quite a bit. And so I started looking around for great education podcasts that were asking fairly scripted questions because I really like the idea that you kind of know what questions are coming. And it's I found it really interesting to hear how these different entrepreneurs were answering these questions. And I basically, I just thought, what if there was something like this in the education world? How cool would that be to feature different principals and teachers and authors who are doing great things in education? And Brian, I couldn't find any podcasts like that. And of course, since I launched, I've discovered there are literally hundreds of podcasts like mine out there, which is awesome. I mean, it's great. I can't listen to them all, but I listen to many of them. But yeah, at the time, and we're talking about the spring of 2018, I decided, well, I've got spring break. I've got some time. I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to launch. I didn't know what I was doing. I made a ton of mistakes. My first episode was an absolute nightmare because the app I was using crashed five or six times on my guest and the sound quality was terrible. But I had this vision of profiling and putting the spotlight on great educators who were doing great things in K-12 education. And so that continues to be my why, just to amplify the voices of these people who are redefining education and casting a light on great practices and sharing those ideas with other educators. And so that continues to be my why today. And that's a passion that I haven't lost a year and a half and and 100 episodes into the pod. I'm, I'm still as excited about it as I was at the beginning. And I think that's a good sign. Well, you know what? You've got a lot of people that are listening and uh, they appreciate the scripted question. When you asked me to be on the podcast, you sent me a list. You sent me the script and these are the questions you're going to ask. And I'm like, wow, those are pretty, pretty good questions. Right. And I listened to more podcasts and went, wow, you know what? It's really important to know what is coming for sure that I can go, you know, at the outset, we're going to hear a, a story about someone's passion about, you know, about their low moment that they've had. And that's really important for that consistency. So well done on uh, keeping that consistent. You have changed slightly since you started. I noticed that once or twice, you know, as it shifted a bit the way you're asking some of the questions. But you know what, that message that you can get out of your guests by that 
you know, those deep questions is important. So yeah, you know, kudos to you for, for doing that. And uh, yeah, Teachers on Fire was born. It's incredible. It's great. Thanks for that, Brian. And let me just say, I mentioned Entrepreneurs on Fire and that podcast is still there. If you take a look in your pod player, you'll find it. And I do want to say in my defense that I honestly looked really hard for a couple of weeks for another name for my podcast. It wasn't my goal to just copy John Lee Dumas and and go with the on fire moniker. But, you know, I tried so many different variations and convolutions of teaching and education. I knew at least one of those words had to be in the name for SEO purposes, because I wanted to think about when teachers are actually looking for a podcast about teaching, what are they typing into their podcast app, right? And so I tried so many different combinations and a lot of people out there are doing clever tweaks on on the word ed, right? But I eventually just came back to Teachers on Fire and it was available on all of the social media platforms where I live. And so I thought that's that's a good sign. And so I'm going for it. And you know, the other thing about style too, I've had an ongoing debate with uh, my friend Jeff Bradbury over at TeacherCast, another great podcast. And he is all about the freestyle conversations. And I do think they have their place. I do think those produce some valuable insights sometimes. But I'm with you, Brian, and I'm glad you appreciate this format because I just think we tend to get better value from guests when they have a chance to think about the question in advance. All right. So how has networking changed for you since you started Teachers on Fire? Were you already involved in a professional learning network? And has it improved and gotten better since you started? Man, my PLN. I would say it was really small, as was my participation there. So there's a rule that I'll share right away that the more you participate in professional learning, the more your network will grow. And as you contribute to the learning of others, they tend to reciprocate and share their learning with you. That's just the simple rule that guides PLNs. And no, I was not well connected outside of my building and outside of my actual school community when I first started. And so that's been definitely a blessing as I've continued this work is just meeting amazing people like you, Brian, and so many others that I continue to have relationships with, some real life, some virtual. I got a chance to meet another guest, Annick Roke, this summer, and she was visiting the Vancouver area. And so our families were able to meet, which was awesome. But no, for the most part, these connections have remained virtual. And I feel like sooner or later at some of these conferences, maybe next time I'm able to visit ISTE, that's going to happen. But yeah, it's just, you know, the more more you get involved. I'll give you one example. When I think about Twitter chats, they are so much fun and people get to see you and hear your thoughts in real time, basically. And that's a, an amazing way to start to build a PLN as well, particularly on Twitter. I have to I have to say I'm biased toward Twitter. I'm a big fan of the way that you can share on the platform. I do like Instagram and I do like Facebook, but Twitter is really where I live the most and and yeah, it's, that's been an awesome part of this whole podcast business is just making so many new connections with other amazing educators. Yeah, well, I've watched that happen over this past uh, year and a half and listening to all the past podcasts and catching up, you know, and being current as of the one you released last night and hearing it and being involved and going, hey, you know, I listened to that and this is what I got out of it this morning, you know, as I was on Twitter. And I think Twitter is an incredible platform. You know, Maybe you can put in your show notes that link about the points of Twitter and why it's important for educators to be connected like that. So I think you had a an article on Medium or something recently about that, right? I did. Yeah, thank you. I would love to share that. And I wrote that partly with those educators in mind who have, quote, tried Twitter, and maybe they've shared a few thoughts, but they haven't really figured out how to engage with others. And Twitter is all about networking. And it's all about interaction is maybe a better word. You have to reply to people, you have to tag people with relevant information and resources. And you know, it's not about spamming either, but it is about engaging. And so yeah, I'd be happy to to share that piece for sure. And to my listeners, I'll say Brian is too modest to mention or or self-promote here in this episode, but I will just say Brian has come up with this amazing hashtag, Fresh Era at Five, which is kind of his mode of sharing. And it's also part of a daily habit for you, right, Brian, that it's become a real ritual in your life that you get out of the house and you go for serious walks too. Like we are not fooling around here. We're talking five mile walks 
and you are listening to podcasts and then sharing out that content. And you do a great job of amplifying the voices of other people, not just from this podcast, but from a bunch of others that are sharing great ideas and resources. And I so appreciate that. Hashtag fresh air at five. All right. How are you looking to grow professionally and improve your practice next year? Can you share about a specific professional goal or project that you're currently working on? You must think about this regularly as you talk to all your guests and ask them this question. Hope this isn't too challenging as you focus. Must ebb and flow depending on what you're learning in your masters and the various guests that are doing great things themselves. That's so true. I mean, I hear what my guests are aiming for in the coming school season and I'm so inspired. But I want to share this news and the timing is perfect. I mean, here we are on episode 100 and I got a call from my advisor at my university program who said that my my draft three of my thesis has been accepted. It's been approved. And I literally cried tears of relief. I mean, this was a bit of a beast over the last two to three months, and it required dropping a lot of balls in my life and unfortunately hiding away from my family far more than I would like. So that dragon has been slayed. And that's been my goal for not just the last two years, but really the last five plus years is to complete a master's in education. And so that is done. Congratulations, Tim. That's fantastic. That that's awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. You've been a huge encouragement and support here in the last few weeks. I, I mean, you know some of the struggles and, and the stress that I've been under to get this finished. So that feels great. But, you know, in terms of a professional goal, I, I guess two quick things. One, and I alluded to this earlier, I want to do more meaningful podcasting with my students. I have this course, Entrepreneurship, which is part of our curriculum here in the province of British Columbia. And why not get my entrepreneurship students to interview, just using their phones, interview real life entrepreneurs that they are connected to, and then publish those on the Great Expectations podcast. So that's my little class podcast. And then professionally, now I hesitate to say this out loud because once I say it out loud, I have to follow it up. But my one word for 2019 was create. And in that article that I posted about my one word, I mentioned the possibility of starting a vlog. And so, you know, the vlog scares me because the time of editing required there is so intense. And I feel like my wife might shoot me if I take on too many projects and responsibilities here. So I'm going to approach that one with caution, Brian. That might have to start with a once a month vlog. We'll see. But you are pretty good yourself at putting out edited videos of some of your hiking trips, and I might have to come to you for ideas. But that's something I would love to do is start to share my ideas through my face. Not that my face is entirely screen friendly, <laughs> but I think it is a very powerful medium in itself. So I'd like to get into the, the YouTube scene a little bit. And like I said, it'll be one slow step at a time. Well, and it only needs to be one slow step. It was back at the beginning of 2017 school year, I think it was. And I decided to do teacher's log, kind of like the Starship Enterprise captain's log thing every day. And for 185 or 190 days, school days in a row, I recorded a one to four minute video that I spun up using Adobe Spark to make the cover slide and then stuck the video behind that and iMovie shot it up to YouTube and published it on my website. So it's not hard to do, to do it regularly, but depending on what you're trying to aim at, that's what's going to take the time, right? So I found that that was a great experience in just having a regular place to speak. And some days I had significant things to say. Other days I'm like, I got not a whole lot to say, but I got to say it because I told you I was going to say that. So I think I had three listeners, but it's not about who's listening. It's about the fact that you're doing it. So it's the practice of regular content creation and skills will improve as you get going on that. So I'm here to help. So reach out. And just that habit of reflection right, Brian? I mean, you're engaging in that process of self-reflection and thinking back to your own practice. And, you know, when we don't blog or vlog or communicate in these other ways, we miss out on that process, I think. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. You know, I was talking to my students about reflection in the classroom and I can go, you know what, guys, I reflect every day. And you got this evidence that says I'm actually doing it, right? They can even go look at it themselves. Not that they did, but it was there and it 
was public. It was authentic. And we had some hard stuff go on in Abbotsford during that year. And it wasn't that I spun up a video to go, oh, there's a hard thing that just happened. I already had a routine in place so that I could just carry on talking about the hard thing that happened in Abbotsford or the joys that are going on and things like that. It is an authentic communication as opposed to something that is fabricated in the moment, right? To be there on Twitter or whatever it was. So if you need some help, I'm here to help. So let's get at it. All right. Outside of education, what's another area of learning for you? What is it that ignites your passion outside of the classroom and brings you alive as a human being? Tell us why this area interests you and why you enjoy it. Well, here in British Columbia, we pride ourselves in sort of being the nature's playground. And I know many areas of North America and really the world can make a similar claim, but we are surrounded by mountains and oceans and lakes and rivers, and it's a, a just a gorgeous area. And so I would love to just continue to learn more about the hiking and paddleboarding activities that occur around me. I'm on my paddleboard a lot. My wife and I own our own paddleboards, and there are so many hikes that I would still like to do in the area as well. And so those are areas that really bring me alive. I am definitely a technophile, and I love my smartphone, but I also don't mind going off the grid and really getting into nature in a deep way. And so you know what I would love, Brian, is a drone that's on my wish list. And I recently found and just a mind-blowing YouTube channel of someone who is creating incredibly beautiful drone videos and combining that with paddle boarding. And so that's the kind of a, a play thing that I would like to learn more about. Well, that sounds great. Getting outside here in BC is incredible. Alrighty, share about one personal habit or productivity hack that contributes to your success. You know, man, I just love listening to my guests answer these questions and, and I've heard so many great ideas, but I am a and I can't remember exactly when it started. I'll have to go back and think about that. But I am a 4.30 waker. And I can't say that it happens every morning. And for example, last night I had a horrible sleep because I was anxious about my thesis. And so I was not able to wake up at 4.30. But when I'm on my game... I'm up at 4.30 and a hack that I learned from a book called The Creative Habit with Twyla Tharp is if you want to make that early morning happen, you've got to get out of the house. And that's exactly what you do and that's exactly what I do because as soon as I am ready for the day, I get into my car and I drive two minutes to my local Starbucks and they open at 4.45. And so my goal is to get there before five o'clock. And if I am there before five o'clock, then I am, as CJ Reynolds says, I am on offense. I'm getting after the day instead of the day getting after me. And so I am able to go through journaling and a little bit of meditation and, and some reflection and different goal setting exercises, and then hopefully actually have time to get some work done as well. And if I am able to start the day with that period of time, with that hour and a half to two hours spent at Starbucks before the school day even starts, then it's going to be a great day. And I will say that during my thesis, I've thrown off my fitness regimen completely, Brian, which is horrible. So I would like to build my 20 to 30 minutes at any time fitness, which just happens to be beside the Starbucks and want to get that back in there as well. But that's my hack is getting up at 430. And that's why I say, you know, it would upset my current rhythm to walk as much as you do starting at 5 a.m. I would have to do some restructuring, but maybe 5 p.m. will be when I get my fresh air at five. That's awesome. That sounds great. So yes, getting up at it and getting at it is important. So just before we continue, I want to share an important message from the Teach Better team. Are you looking to reach more students, innovate your instruction, and teach better? Then join the Teach Better team on November 8th and 9th in Northwest Ohio for the first ever Teach Better conference. Join dynamic educators such as Dave Burgess, Tall Tale Thompson, Adam Welcome, and more. Register now at www.teachbetterconference.com. Be sure to use the discount code FIRE50 to save $50 on either of the two-day registration options. Are you ready to be better? All right, it's time for your quick picks, the education voices and resources, Tim, that are shaping your practice and inspiring your thinking today. Starting with Twitter, tell us about someone who we should follow and share why they've been inspiring you lately. Well, I'm taking a risk by singling out a past guest because all my 98 other guests will 
wonder, hey, why not me? <laughs> but as someone who is right here in my neck of the woods is Nina Pak Louie. And the reason I'm calling her out is she is doing incredible things for pre-service teachers at the university level. She is an experienced middle school teacher herself, but she's got her head in post-secondary and just recently in the research work herself. So She's also new to professional learning networks in the active sense of getting involved on Twitter and other platforms. And so I am so excited about what she is doing. I am telling you, Brian, big things ahead for this lady, Nina Pak Louie, and you can follow her at N-P-A-K-L-U-I. I totally agree. That was a great interview that you had with her a couple of weeks ago and took me a couple of days to listen to it because she had a lot to say. So that was really good. <laughs> Point us to an ed tech tool that you currently love using in your classroom or your professional practice. I'm going to single out WeVideo. It's a cloud-based video editing platform, and WeVideo is doing great things for learners. They're allowing students to create some phenomenal things. It is not as powerful as iMovie, and it's not as convenient or as powerful as Adobe Premiere and some other programs. But in terms of a cloud-based solution that will work on any device, any laptop device, WeVideo is where it's at. So thank you, WeVideo, for enabling my students to learn about video editing, some of them for the very first time. And I can't wait to create content with my students this year. Just this morning, we started on our first project of the term, which is trick shot videos. So we watched a Dude Perfect classic that has been viewed 168 million times. And those guys are incredible. They're good inspiration. And then my students headed out of the classroom to film trick shots. So we video is what makes it all possible. Recommend one book, one that you've been reading lately or one of your all time favorites and tell us why you recommend it, Tim. I'm going to call out a book called Big Magic and it's by someone named Elizabeth Gilbert, but she writes very candidly and in very clever ways about about the creative process and about all of the fears that we face as writers and creators. And so if you are looking to write or create content, whether it's podcasting or video making, but writing is really her wheelhouse addressing Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And she, by the way, is the author of Eat, Pray, Love. So she has had a few bestsellers, but she talks about all of the years she spent writing long before she was really recognized as an author and just really funny, really insightful and it's it's just easy reading at bedtime. So that book's been great. Good. I think I'll have to put that in my Kindle, kind of like you do all the time, right? You, your Kindle must be really full of great books. It is jam-packed full, but I've always got room for more. Perfect. Are you a podcast listener, Tim? If so, recommend one podcast and tell us why you love it. Well, you know I'm a listener, Brian, and my theory is that every podcast producer started out as a podcast fan, if not an addict themselves, and so I've got so many going on in my deck, I honestly cannot listen to them all, but one that I will mention here, a great education podcast doing very similar work to myself is the Teach Better Talk podcast, and the Teach Better Talk podcast is hosted by Jeff Gargas and Ray Hewitt, both of them former guests of Teach... <laughs> what is mine called? Teachers on Fire. And they are, I told them the other day, I think there is no one really out there doing it quite as they are doing it. So they have a really good rapport and a really fun banter with each other. They kind of give each other a lot of digs, but you can tell it's all affectionate. And they do a lot of the same work that I'm trying to do, which is amplifying the voices of educators who are doing amazing things in K-12 education. So teach better talk. Well, I'm going to have to start listening to that myself, Tim. So I just subscribed. So they're on my deck now. There we go. All right. Tell us about one YouTube channel you enjoy and tell us why. The one that comes to mind right away is called Real Rap with Reynolds. And as a disclaimer, there is no rap involved in the channel, but it is hosted by CJ Reynolds and He's a teacher at an all boys high school in Philadelphia, just a phenomenal guy. And I can't stop watching his stuff. I loved him so much. I thought early on in this podcast biz, I've got to get CJ on the show. And he graciously agreed to come on and you've listened to all of my episodes, Brian. So I don't know if you remember that one. 
but he's just a really authentic guy. And as good as he was on the Teachers on Fire podcast, he is better on his vlog and they are well produced. And he tackles real tough topics and relevant stuff there on his vlog channel that I think we can all benefit from. Real Rap with Reynolds, awesome channel. That one stands out to me because I was uh, driving home from the May long weekend when I heard that episode. So I remember that. Very cool. Just for fun, not related to education at all. Um, what are you watching on Netflix right now? My family has been enjoying Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I know it's a popular choice. We actually watched through all of The Office which was great. And I mean, personally in comedy category, The Office is my all-time favorite. But uh, once we finished The Office, lately it's been Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And then lately my wife and I have been watching a few episodes of Jack Ryan on Amazon Prime. We actually have an Amazon Prime account at the moment. And you know, it's hard to see John Krasinski in that serious role. It takes some getting used to for sure after you've watched nine seasons of The Office or however many (laughs) seasons that ran for. But you know, he's He's not bad. He's not bad. And the plots are definitely compelling. So I've been enjoying that lately too. Oh, that sounds great. All right. What are the best ways for listeners to follow you? So, you know, we all follow you. We listen. So uh, (laughs) you can go over those for those that are new to the podcast. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're in, if you're out there tuning into the podcast and you're not connected to me on Twitter or Instagram or one of these places, please do so. And that's going to keep you in touch with what I'm publishing and some other great content as well. And so the answer, Brian, is pretty simple. It's Teachers on Fire. And that same name will take you to me, whether you're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. So find me at all those places. Sounds good, Tim. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. And uh, it was finally good to hear your story in uh, the detail that we've heard many other educators stories. So again, thanks so much for sharing your time with us on the podcast. And this has been fun. Take care and let's talk again soon, Tim. You got it, Brian. I so appreciate your friendship. And I know we're going to continue to connect on Twitter and in real life, IRL, as the kids say. And I can't thank you enough for your support of the show, Brian. So Keep going with those fresh air at fives and keep sharing your learning. You are helping the cause of education, I know for me and for so many others. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining me today here on the Teachers on Fire podcast. For show notes and links from this episode, visit teachersonfire.net. You can also follow the show at Teachers on Fire on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And again, please do subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Before we sign off today, I'd like to share some highlights from around the Teachers on Fire community this week. First of all, I'd like to thank those who encourage and support the podcast on Twitter. George Valenzuela at George Does PBL on Twitter recently tweeted, Just got my daily dose of PD by listening to at D. Krynus on the Teachers on Fire podcast with Mr. KV, and it was awesome. Love Dan's confidence in his work. Quote, I'm my biggest fan. End quote. I will now be listening to the Leader of Learning podcast. Well, thank you for that, George. Next, Bonnie Neves, and I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, Bonnie. At Biology Goddess tweeted, fantastic listen at Teachers on Fire with D. Krynus. That's at D. Krynus on Twitter. Importance of finding your fit. Quote, sometimes great people don't work perfectly with other great people. End quote. She gives some shout outs to at Sarah the Teacher, at Alien Earbud, at BT Costello 05, and at edu underscore match and those were all people and organizations singled out by dan on episode 99 so thank you for that bonnie and then finally the office of digital learning at the university of oklahoma i'm not sure i know anyone there but they are apparently friendly to the podcast and they can be found on twitter at ou underscore digilearn they tweeted out today's suggested listen for the evening commute episode 94 of teachers on fire features education consultant at ms underscore mac4 talking about her experiences with education and her hopes for the future Check out the episode, episode 94, Janelle McLaughlin. Well, thank you so much for that encouragement, George, Bonnie, and the Office of Digital Learning at the University of Oklahoma. You three were the fuel to my fire this week. And if you've engaged, liked, retweeted, responded in any way to my contributions on Twitter, thank you so much for engaging with the podcast there. 
Educators, I will also invite you to check out the Teachers on Fire magazine on Medium. This week we featured two pieces, one called Engagement, Invite versus Direct, How the Words We Choose Make a Difference by Tammy Breitweiser, and she can be found on Twitter at T-L-B-R-E-I-T. And then secondly, we had Modeling Writing and Revision in Your Classroom by Caitlin Giordano, and she can be found on Twitter at Mrs. underscore Giordano. And interestingly enough, Caitlin wrote the piece on her screen in real time in front of her class. So think about that. She did some blogging in her classroom. I just love that. <laughs> love that idea so much, Caitlin. So at some point, I may have to try the same. Well, if you're wondering what in the world is the Teachers on Fire magazine, it is a Medium publication, and you'll find it on Medium.com or on the Medium app. If you're already an education blogger, consider joining our growing writing team there. You can continue to publish content on your own blog and you keep full credit and ownership of your content on Medium. Message Teachers on Fire on any social media platform for more details. Well, if you do enjoy education blogs, check out the Teacher Blogs podcast, a podcast for teachers who have more time to listen to blog posts than to read them. The mission of this podcast is to amplify the voices of education writers that are seen, read, but need to be heard. The podcast has taken a bit of a hiatus as I pushed to finish my master's thesis and then started the new school year, but hooray, I am finished my thesis, finished all of my master's work, in fact, and the Teacher Blogs podcast will be back shortly. Something else I have not done a very good job of in terms of promoting this podcast is asking my listeners to leave reviews of the show on Apple Podcasts. So if you are listening on an iPhone right now, would you kindly leave me a five-star rating and a quick comment about what you appreciate about the show? I'd be incredibly grateful and would love to shout you out in this space on a future episode. Thank you so much. And Android Nation, I'm not forgetting about you wonderful people and all the other many platforms and apps you might be listening listening on, including Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, Podbean, Breaker, or my personal favorite at the moment, CastBox. The reason so many edu podcasters mention Apple Podcasts is simply that for better or for worse, Apple is far and away the king of the podcast world. Their ratings and rankings do matter a lot, and so your rating will help Teachers on Fire get noticed by other listeners. Thank you again. Well, I want to leave you with a thinking question, and so on my Facebook page, you'll find this one. This week, we celebrate 100 episodes, kind of a big deal in the podcasting world, and yes, I am very, very happy about this accomplishment. Looking ahead to episode 200, hard to imagine at this point, but I'll get there eventually, who would you like to see on the show? Please tag them below and thank you for listening. So that's up on my Facebook page. Surf on over there and tell me your pick for a future guest. Well, I'll leave you with this quote, Teachers on Fire, and it comes from Star Saxton in her book, Hacking Assessment, where she writes, At times, the shift away from traditional grades was exceptionally challenging. It was much easier, I realized, to just put a grade on student work. That's a great quote, and that goes back to something that I've been saying, that good assessment is actually harder work, it's more valuable, but feedback takes more time. And the traditional grading paradigm has that Achilles heel in that it lets us as educators off the hook. It's much easier to just give a grade or even a zero and move on. But gradeless assessment, assessment for learning, requires us to look a little bit closer at the learner's progress and step in to support them as they need it. So thank you, Star, for that great quote. Again, I'm your host, Tim Cavey, and I'm so grateful once again that you decided to spend some of your day listening to this podcast. I hope that in some way the content you heard in this 100th edition of the show ignited your thinking and inspired your practice. And I'll meet you next week right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast. Take care and have a great week.